Okay, so our presenter this evening is Scott Negley. He's been doing over 40 years of astronomy education to all sorts of different audiences. And he's also a solar system ambassador. Uh, so he's going to be speaking tonight about the Leonid meteor shower. And I'm going to let him take it away. Good evening, folks. Nice to be with you in a virtual sense. Normally in the past, when we do these meteor shower talks, we always are able to go outside and look up at the meteors, look up at the sky and find some, but we'll have to save that for next year, hopefully. We're starting, of course, out of the sky. There's a lot of things that come out of the sky, so let's get started. Actually, the talk really involves three key things, comets, meteors, and asteroids. Those things, those three items really go back to the beginning of the solar system. Four and a half billion years ago, when the sun got started, it really it formed out of a huge cloud of gas. In fact, it was a very large cloud of gas because probably the sun was not formed by itself. Probably it was in the group of 15 or 20 or 25 stars that all formed together. In the intervening several billion years, they've gone their separate ways. So we have no star right next to us. But that early, that early uh, coagulation of material turned into sort of a spinning disk. All the stars, if you notice back on that previous picture, you notice they all started to spin in that cloud. And so as they were spinning more and more, they started to throw off material, make sort of a disk out of it. It's kind of like Saturn's rings. And as it continued to co co coalesce, the disk started to take on more distinctive shape in terms of the items that were coalescing into the would-be planets. And so you finally had this situation here where the small and large plants were about to form. And of course, that's how it looked when they got started. But you'll notice there's a lot of material in between the planets, chunks of ice, chunks of rock, and that's really the basis of our story tonight. So there it is, shortly after it got started, and you see all those chunks in their orbits around the sun. Icy chunks, they're gonna to lead to the comets. Rocky chunks, they're gonna to lead to the asteroids. And of course, that's our that's our, our source for all the things we're going to talk about. The icy chunks will form the comets. The asteroids will form meteors, meteor, meteorites, I should say. So let's start with the comets first. A chunk of ice, sometimes, well, in fact, the original solar system, in fact, it's, it still exists like this. You have the, you notice at the center, that is our, that's our set of planets. And that surrounding that set of planets, is this thing called the Oort comet cloud. A huge, huge sort of a sphere of ice chunks. And we'll never run out of these ice chunks. I mean, they, they, most of the time, they don't even come anywhere near us to, to be affected by the sun. And so they have these orbits that take thousands of years to go around the sun. They never come close to it. We think there may be a trillion comet chunks in this Oort comet cloud, a trillion. Now, this let me show it. Let me get this. Uh, this is the outer orbit of, the, of one of these chunks. And you can see they take thousands of years to orbit the sun. So this is never going to make a comet. That ice chunk will just go around and around maybe every 20, 30,000 years. They won't do anything. But what will happen is, in some cases, stars come by. A nearby star comes by. And when it does, it's going to pull on those chunks if they're out in the outer reaches. And when he pulls on those chunks, what will happen then will be, it's going to slow down that chunk. It's going to make the chunk now, instead of doing this, instead of doing this, it's going to fall in toward the sun. And when it does that, you've got yourself a new comet. Comets have tails when they're near the sun. If you're lucky, you'll see a double tail. In that particular case, you see the blue tail would be a tail of, of ionized gases. This is a dust tail right here. Now, once the comets become, in a sense, an inner solar system object, it's not going way out to that outer or comet cloud, it'll take maybe 40 years, maybe 50 years, maybe 20 years, depending on how far out it is. Some go out to Neptune, some only go out to Mars, some only go out to Jupiter. But when they go out, they'll go out in their orbit, and then when they come back in, get close, that's when they make the tail. Notice the chunk of ice is generally somewhere around 10 to 20 miles. That's what it's working on. And of course, it'll shrink with time. When it's in close to the sun, that's when it heats up enough to make the tail. 
tail always points away from the sun. There's your comet ice chunk, and here's the tail coming off right here. And that's a close-up for you. This is actually a picture taken of Halley's uh, comet nucleus in 1986. You can see the gas coming off. This is sort of a dark ice uh, clump right here. Now the tail, as I said, always points away from the sun. And there's a good example of your double tail. The blue jets there, these blue jets, are the, ion, the ionized gas tail. And then the yellow would be where the, the, dust, the dust tail would be. Each of those yellow tails is a dust tail. Now this, as a comet goes around the sun, again, the tail always points away. And as you, by the way, I should back that up just a little bit because when it's in, right in here, let me back to this. You always, are gonna, you're gonna see the best comet, of course, when it's closest. And then once it starts going away, and of course it shrinks down, and now you've lost it. That is the set of pictures taken of Halley's Comet back in 1910. Halley is the most famous name with comets. Ironically, Halley never found his comet. Normally, that's how you get your name on a comet. Person who finds it first, it's named after him. He didn't find it first. What Halley did, he noticed, he was, this is probably about, oh, 1610, 1620 or so, he noticed, actually, I should say more like 1710, he noticed that there were three comets. They were very similar, the way people describe them, extremely similar in, in their appearance and their characteristics. And then he noticed that also they seem to be separated by the same amount of time, 75 or 76 years. So, hmm, could that be three different comets that all happen to look alike? Or might it be more logical to have those three objects be the same single comet just coming around every 75 or 76 years. So he said, I think it's gonna come back. Is he gonna come back in 1757 or 1758? Well, he was, wasn't young enough to be able to live for 1758's arrival. But when it came back, Christmas Day, that's what it looked like over London in 1758. And because he did such a good job of predicting it, it's been called Alex Comet ever since. He goes around goes out past Neptune, heads on back in. And you notice in red there, 1910, very special year in Halley's Comet. Unfortunately, in 1910, maybe 1908, 1909, just before its arrival, we discovered that there was cyanogen gas in the tail of the comet. Most people said, don't worry about it. Unfortunately, one European astronomer said, that could be a problem, folks. That may, that may kill people. And so that set off the whole panic, the cyanogen gas panic for the comet. So coming end of the world. To escape the comet, hire a submarine boat. Go down under the water in a submarine. The gases can't get you. Ridiculous. Almost every scientist said there's no worry, but unfortunately, news got out in the newspapers and it just fan spread and people became terrified. Hope's anti-comet pills, 20 cent, 25 cents a piece, which back in 1910 was probably more like $4 a piece. Take those pills, you're guaranteed you're never going to get sick from the comet. Of course, you couldn't get sick anyway. These fellows saw an opportunity. They sold comet pills out west and made a fortune on it. Well, 1986, when it came by, nobody had died, as evidenced by this group of people. These are Halley's Comet two-timers. You have to be lucky to be a two-timer. I should say you have to be born at the right time. And in this case, each one of these people had seen the comet back in 1910 and saw it again in 1986. So obviously, they, they didn't die from the comet fumes. To see Halley's Comet twice, if you're not born at the right, in the right time slot, you're not going to have a chance. Like, for instance, this 1986, anybody born probably in 19, oh, 1980, 1982, they're, they're maybe four years old, six years old when it came by. That means they have to be 80 when it comes back in 2062. But if you're, if you're born, let's say, in 19, in, uh, let's say 1998, or I should say 1978, you're going to have more trouble finding that, that comet for the second time. So in 2062, that's when it's due back for people lucky enough to have a shot at it. Most comets, when you see a picture of a comet in a, in a book, often it's taken with a time-lapse camera on a telescope. And it's a tremendous structure to it. 
you see it's fantastic. And they go out and look at a comet in the sky. That's a good comet right there. But that's even that, you don't see that kind of a comet very often. We have had two fantastic comets. Ironically, one right after the other. 1996, Comet Yakutake. That comet was so fantastic in terms of its length. I remember, you can see my arms, going out in the sky, looking up at the sky and having my arms be that far apart to, to get to the end and the, and the beginning of the comet. It was very close to the Earth, which is what made it look so large. It, was very, it didn't last that long. It was a pretty fast-moving comet. So we only had it for maybe a few weeks. Next year, after, after Yakutake, the next year, the Great Comet, and that was a comet called hale Bob. That comet was absolutely fantastic. You could see that comet. First of all, we could see it for probably several months. You could be in your car driving down I-95, looking through the windshield, you would see that comet. It was that good. Now, the reason it has two names, Hale and Bop both found it the same night. So they gave them the shared, shared uh, ownership of the comet. There's, of course, more people, more people saw that comet probably than any other comet in history. This comet is a comet we just had this summer, Neil Weiss. And it's a comet, basically, it's named after, named after a, a project for studying for asteroids and comets. That's another thing that I'll talk about a little later on. We have to keep an eye on those things. This comet, the, this, this instrument that found it was in Neil Weiss, and so they called it Comet Neil Weiss. Now, that comet, if you notice this picture, this is a, this is a, a finger chart in Sky and Telescope. You'll notice that they have the Big Dipper, and then below the Big Dipper, you see all these comet tails day by day from about the 15th of July up to the 23rd. This, I saw this here in, in Kenny Buck, and you can see there's a Big Dipper right there. See the Big Dipper? Here's a Big Dipper right here. So this comet was just below the Big Dipper. So this must have been, this picture here must have been taken about July 18th. That was the best comet we've had in a while. And if you, you had to have good dark skies, you couldn't have a, a lot of moonlight messing things up, and you didn't want to have a lot of, a lot of city lights around you either. But that was a nice comment. Now, we talked about the tail that comes out of the comet's nucleus. That comet tail is what, of course, gives us the meteor showers. Now, you hear the word meteor. There's actually three ways you can use that word. Meteoroid, meteor, and meteorite all have the same base. Meteoroid, OID, that's when it's traveling through space on its way to us. Plain meteor is when it comes from the atmosphere and glows like a falling star, shooting star they often call it. And funny, if you're lucky enough, or if it's lucky enough to be big enough to survive the fall, it'll land on the ground, you call that a meteorite. People try to find those things. If you find a meteorite, they can be worth some money. More and more people are getting into meteorite collecting with each passing decade. Most meteors begin with very small items, very small particles, about the size of a grain of sand. So you think, well, how it's amazing how such a small particle can make something you can see so easily 30 or 40 or 50 miles up in the sky. But what happens when that particle, when that, when that same size particle hits the atmosphere, it gets so hot. In fact, it does it blast through the atmosphere, ionizes the oxygen, ionizes the nitrogen, and you have the light that's been released by that ionization coming down this in the form of a falling star, shooting star. There's one right there. This is about the pace they have. Sometimes they might go a little quicker. And that's, that's a pretty nice meteor right there in terms of its brightness. That's almost, that's almost at the brightness down here, right, right here. That, at the end of the run there, that's about as bright as a fireball. And fire, we'll talk about fireballs in just a few minutes. So you get meteor showers. Now, meteor showers happen when the Earth simply runs into the cloud. So in this case, you've got the Earth going around the sun. And this is the orbit of some comet. I'm not sure which one it is. It's just an atypical comet. Let me go back on it. And so in this orbit, what happens over the time, over a period of time, that orbit gets loaded with comet dust. It's just filled up with comet dust. 
And so when the Earth runs into that comet dust, it makes a meteor shower. Like right here. All those specks, when the Earth runs into it, you get the meteor shower. And you notice this is a list of good meteor showers. We probably all together have maybe 25 different meteor showers. There are only nine on this list. Most, most of the meteor, sh meteor showers, they might be maybe three an hour, four an hour. You'll notice over here we have, the first of all, the name. By the way, you notice the name, if you know your constellations, if you're into astronomy a little bit, you see Orionids, that's Orion. Perseids, that's Perseus. The name of the meteor shower comes from the constellation that it seems to be coming from. So the one we're talking about for tonight and this week, the Leonids coming from Leo. Now you'll notice tonight, actually tonight and into tomorrow morning, November 16, November 17 the, is the peak date. But you'll notice it's about seven or eight days here that it's supposedly visible. So what happens on November 14th, it starts off with a few meteors and it builds and builds and builds until you get to the 16th or 17th. Then you get your peak and then it starts receding again. Now you notice the different numbers here. There's several that stand out as being really good. Quadradids, 120 per hour. Geminids in December, 120 per hour. This one's 40 per hour. The Perseids in August, 90 per hour. Now, when we talk about the rates per hour, that's the absolute premium number. You won't see that if you go out at eight or nine o'clock in the evening. Generally, you see more meteors if you go out after midnight. It gets better as the night wears on. But most of the time, they'll tell you the meteors are best somewhere in the one to two o'clock time, time period, which is tough for people who have to get up the next morning. So what I often do, I'll, I'll watch at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Sometimes, depending on what the shower is, I may try to catch a one or two o'clock, but it's, it is tough to, to uh, see the seam at their peak. Of course, the other thing that enters into it also, moonlight. If you have a lot of moonlight, that's going to knock these numbers down terribly. If you get a full moon, you'll be nowhere near 90 or 120 because the sky is too bright. That's why it's, there's another problem with this. In fact, you notice the Perseids, the Orionids, the Leonids, and Geminids, that pack of four, they're all separated by about a month, which that can be a problem. Because if you have a full moon around this time, there'll be a full moon, close to a full moon here, here, and here. A full moon will wipe out all four of the meteor showers. That's the trouble. Now, the Earth goes around it, the sun in its orbit, and as it runs into these different patches of dust, that's when you get to different meteor showers. August 12th, the Perseids. The Orionids in October. Our Leonids coming up tonight. And in December next month, the Geminids. So there's your, that's the pack of four. And that's, that's the one we, we sort of focus on. The summer, summer ones are, well, the, the May and Aquarids aren't too bad. But the, the Delta Aquarids are not too much. And of course, the summertime, it's kind of tough because your, your lighting is not as good in the summer. You have this, the moisture in the air and so forth, too much haze. The, person, the, the best time is, is December if you, can stand, if you can stand the weather. It's so cold. Now, that's what the Perseids look like. Now we're, that's, of course, an August one. We're not going to get that tonight. But you notice the meteors all seem to come out of the constellation Perseus. The reason for that is as the Earth plows into that dust, as it plows into the dust, we're headed right toward Perseus. And so because we're plowing into the dust, it makes all the meteors seem to come from that part of the sky. The analogy I like to use, there's your Earth plowing into the dust. The analogy I like to use, there's the land, it's right there. In fact, you see Leo. Here's Leo right here. And of course, all these are coming away from Leo. Think of the last time you were in a car during the winter time and it was snowing. If you're stopped at a traffic light, all the snowflakes appear to be coming straight down. As soon as that car starts to move out of the intersection and you start to head down the road, instead of coming straight down, the snowflakes seem to be coming from over your hood. They seem to be coming from the direction that you're headed toward, just like the meteors do. They come from the direction we're headed toward. Okay, the Leonid meteor shower. There it is. The radiant, you'll hear the term radiant used. The radiant is the point at which all the meteors seem to emanate from. 
and the radiant here you can see would be right, right about in this area there. That, by the way, with Leo, Leo's an easy one to find because you've got a backward, sort of a backward question mark there. It's Leo the lion, and that's his mane right here. That's the lion's head. This would be the lion's chest right here. So there's, there's the earth going around the sun. And of course, we hit, sooner or later hit the, the dust bank. But here's the deal. With the Leonid meteor shower, it comes from comet Temple Tuttle. Temple Tuttle's orbit period is 33 years. Now you notice, if you go back, go back to that previous picture, Picture this as dust now. Of course, their dust is showing you in the orbit. Picture that as dust. Most comet orbits, the dust is fairly uniformly spread out. There's no real pockets of any extra concentration. But on the Temple Tuttle orbit, you'll notice it's really bunched in here. Out here, it's pretty rarefied. It's not at all uniform. So what happens is, it's like, think of a, think of a bicycle chain with 33 links. And each year, one of these links moves up a notch. So this is the, the one we run into this year. Another year later, that batch will be over here. Another year later, it'll be over here. So 33 years later, you get that same batch again. What that means is you get fantastic meteors, often every 33 years with the Leonids. So in 1799, that happened over Florida. 1833, over Germany. Another one over Germany, 1866. In Texas, I know a planetarium friend of mine was in school at that time, and they went out of the dorm that night to look at the sky. This is a picture somebody, somebody took of, of the, just a little part of the sky. This is the Big Dipper right here. See the stars in the Big Dipper right here? There's the Big Dipper. In that one little area of the sky, in 45 seconds, over 43 meteors, a meteor a second, in just that small part of the sky. Imagine the whole sky now. They, I think they had 15, I think they had 150,000 meteors an hour. That was their peak at that particular night. Here in County Bunk, we saw from our front yard, we saw 1,000 meteors in three hours. That's not bad. That wasn't as good as Texas. So you get a meteor, sailing through the sky. Regular meteors just re make regular shooting stars, small meteoroids. They don't do too much. And it's nice to watch, but the really good stuff comes when you have a meteorite that's large, a meteoroid. When this meteoroid hits the atmosphere, first of all, it won't burn up. Meteors burn up. Most meteors burn up. In fact, a lot of people don't realize it. The Earth gets hit with 100 tons of, of, of meteor dust and material every day. Every day, 100 tons a day. You think, well, gosh, that, we must be covered in dust. It still takes a lot, of, a lot of dust to add up to anything noticeable. If you have an outdoor swimming pool in your backyard, not at this time of the year, but if you have an outdoor swimming pool when summer comes around, guaranteed, you can be guaranteed if that's open to the sky, you're gonna have meteor dust in that water. I saw a person once with a wading pool run a magnet through the water and pick up meteor dust that way. Now, a large meteoroid like the one I show here, that, that's going to make a very much, much, much better meteor. In fact, it's going to make a fireball like that. That's a fireball, folks. And often when you get a fireball, there'll be a meteorite somewhere in that area. People often will try to track it down. It's, it's tough to get them though. Because often they'll land in woods, they'll be buried in, in the in the ground, it's tough to find them. Let's see. Now this, this is one that happened 28 years ago in Peekskill, New York. Watch. It's gonna break into pieces. Four or five pieces, it's, it's split into. Fortunately, it was a Friday night, a man was there to videotape his, his kids at the football in the football game. And he saw this and he got that on the tape. Goes across all those states and winds up hitting a girl's car outside New York City. That's what it did to the car. 
Now the car is only a jalopy, it's maybe worth uh, two or three hundred dollars. She used it to go to school. That's a meteorite. It hit the car. She looks maybe unhappy, you would say, certainly sad. She shouldn't be sad because a couple of days later, somebody paid her ten thousand dollars for that car that was worth three hundred dollars before it all happened. One up actually in the museum now. Now this is probably the only person who has a direct contact with a meteorite in terms of it coming out of the sky. Her name is Ann Elizabeth Hodges. She lived in Silicaga, Alabama. As you see here, her name is now along the side of the road as a special site, Hodges Meteorite. Well, how'd she get her name on that meteorite? Well, meteor, the meteor itself came across the sky. They had a sonic boom, this is daytime, about three, two o'clock in the afternoon. She's taking a nap. And the meteorite, about an eight pound meteorite, punched a hole through the roof, came through the roof, bounced off that floor model radio, and landed on her. Didn't break any bones, amazingly enough. Only made that hideous bruise. Had she been outside taking a nap, and it hit her outside without anything like the roof slowing down the speed, she would have been in bad shape. She hoped to make a fortune. She could hit with a meteorite. I mean, that, that's unique. That's the only person who's ever had that happen. There's a meteorite right there. That's after they got it back. She didn't keep it right away. They took it away to check it out. By the time they got it back, she and her husband, they thought they could make a fortune. By the time they got possession of it, it wasn't worth anything. And they basically wound up giving it to a, to a museum. She did get her name in the magazines. Life magazine had that article, Big Bruiser from the Sky. Another interesting meteorite situation occurred in Arizona. This is the meteor crater. If you've ever gone to the Grand Canyon, you've been close to it. And if you ever go to the Grand Canyon, take that in on your part of your trip. 50,000 years ago, we got hit. That part of the country got hit by a fairly good sized chunk of iron. Left the crater about a mile wide, 600 feet deep. A fellow from a geologist from Philadelphia heard about this and thought he could make a fortune getting the iron out of that crater because there had to be a lot of iron in there. He must have drilled 28 times trying to get the iron out. Never could find any because most of it, it most of it had come down in tiny little pellets and they were outside the outside the crater. That's what it looks like. You can see some of the areas where he did his drilling right in here. He used to have high school classes going to that crater. It, science teachers would take him in and they could go down in there. It's too dangerous now. They don't want to do that anymore. That's how big the meteorite was to made the crater. As big as a 15-story building. And that's just one of, the, I'm, one of the meteorites that resulted from it. But it's a small fraction of what was there originally. Now, other big falls. This one was in Oregon back in about 1900. A couple of guys hiking in a, in a mountain hillside, found this, this meteorite. They spent three months dragging it off the mountain, bringing it down to their own backyard. They thought they could make a fortune. Unfortunately, the people owned the, the company owned the hillside. Said, well, thanks for bringing our meteorite down. We'll take it off your hands now. So you never got to use it. It wound up in the Museum of Natural History in New York. Another big guy, this, was happen this happened up in Northern Greenland, in the Arctic Circle. Admiral Perry found this one. And the Eskimos up there had, was using this as a, like a religious sh a shrine. He somehow was able to get away from them by trading, uh, trading a lot of iron uh, beams for some building they were trying to build. He brought that down and that wound up in the museum. There it is in New York also, same place. The largest one that's ever been found is still where it was found, 60 tons. You don't move that too easily. So they didn't, they couldn't take that to any museum. They brought the people to it. So people take trips, they'll take vacationers and they'll bring them out and give them a talk about the meteorite. And of course, I guess the most famous or infamous one that's ever, that's ever been found or not found but discussed is the one that hit the Yucatan in Mexico. It's about six to nine miles wide, 66,000 BC. I should say million, 66 million BC. It came out of the sky, hit the Yucatan, left, made this crater about 100 miles wide. And 
the output of a what it did to the atmosphere. It, it the, the smoke, the clouds, the dust that kicked up. The atmosphere was ruined as far as the climate for several years. It froze everything down. Most of the animals died. Three quarters of the, of the life, the, the animal life died. The animals were inside burrows had a better chance. They made it, but it was a terrific impact. Now you say, well, gosh, did that happen again? Well, I suppose that's something like that only happens every 50 million years or so, but you do have to keep an eye on these things. Now, this, this is more modern, this one right here. And actually there are two, ironically, that hit, me, hit uh, Russia in about a hundred years apart, 1908 in Tunduska and this past century, this past 2013, again in Russia. The Tunduska event, that was a daytime meteor. That was so powerful. They had the, the shock waves, supposedly knocked some guy off his rocking chair 40 miles away. That might be a stretch, but that's what they say. The seismic uh, shock waves, they picked them up in Sweden from what that did to the ground. It knocked 60 million trees out of, off, their, off their base. 800 square miles cleared from the impact. They never found a crater, uh, found a, a meteorite. They never found any residue, just, just this open plain. Then not too long ago, seven years ago, in Russia again, Chelyabinsk, this is a daytime meteor. Let's watch what happens. Here we go. Chris and Driving had a camcorder on his dashboard. I don't seem to want to be, let's go back on that for some reason. Let's see if it does it better this time. It's about eight o'clock in the morning. People on the way to work. That's a trail it left after it hit. That did not hit the building. That was a shock wave that knocked down the wall of that factory. That's where the meteorite landed in that frozen lake. Some school teacher told her kids she saw what was happening. She told her kids, duck and cover, get yourselves under those desks. She saved their, their faces because they say over a thousand people had facial cuts from shattered glass hitting them in the face. Now, the other question is, what happens if we have one of these, like Chelyabinsk or Tunguska? What do we do if one's coming our way? Well, first of all, they happen about every 100 years. They're not real large. They still, if you're under them, it's not going to be good for you, obviously, or your town. The biggest thing you have to worry about is something much bigger size. This Bennu, you may have heard you may have heard about the new once in a while they talk about that in the news. It's an asteroid that supposedly is coming our way in 150 years. Now the chance of hitting us is very slim as you can see. One out of 2,700 chance to hit the earth. So your odds are pretty good. But even those odds, we're not satisfied to even have one in 2,700 chance. So what NASA is trying to do with any near earth object, like an asteroid, they're trying to keep tabs on it, where it is, what kind of a path it's following, and be ready to do something if need be. So if one is coming our way, like Bennu, in 20, 150 years, what they would have to do is go up with some kind of a device and push that thing off to the side, just give it a little bit of deflection, just enough to make it miss us. That's how they would deal with that if we ever have one of those coming our way. And probably someday one will. It may not be for another 5,000 years, another 10,000 years. But they have to keep an eye on those things. All right, gets into the meteor shower we're talking about tonight. There it is. You can see they all come out of the Leo. Recommended viewing the tent equipment. If you want to go out, look for meteors. Do not, under any conditions, go out with binoculars or a telescope. You couldn't be worse off than, than that. You want, to have, you want to see as much of the sky as you can. Any of those objects are going to reduce the sky down to a tiny little area. You want to have the whole vision as much as you can. That's your equipment right there, folks. Now, you could stand there like that, just look up like those two did for the, for the big comet. 
but your neck might start to disagree with that after maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But what you want to do, stretch out. It's some kind of a chaise lounge like this. Lean back and just look up at the sky. This time of the year, you may want to add, add that to the, to the equipment too, because it, one, thing about, one thing about cold weather, I'm, sure you, I'm not telling you it's something you don't know, but sometimes you forget. When you walk from your car to a store to go shopping, your body heat, just in walking, keeps you a little warmer than you might normally be. When you're lying on a chair, not moving, you get cold in a hurry. And that's why you want to really layer it as much as you can, like even tonight, and certainly in December, if you want to try for December. Now, you have received, I think, the star chart called the Evening Sky Map. I'll show you that picture a little later on. This is one I've made up for school kids. Now, when you're doing a star chart, you're showing the constellations in the sky. What you're doing is, sky is kind of like a big inverted bowl, a huge mixing bowl. And you're trying to show a bowl, what's on that bowl, which is not flat on a flat piece of paper. It's kind of tricky, but what it comes out to be, you wind up with a circle. And this circle right here, that circle is your horizon. Any constellation, these are all constellations, any constellation near that, near that circle is going to be near the ground. So for instance, here's the Big Dipper over here. It shows the Big Dipper just above the horizon over here, just in the north. By the way, to use these charts, if you want to see some object, you turn, let's say you want to see the Big Dipper, you turn this chart around so north is on the bottom as you're holding it. And then you look at how close the Big Dipper is to the, to the edge, that means the Big Dipper is going to be very close to the ground. Right here where I live, I have a, lot of, have a lot of tall trees. I cannot see the Big Dipper now, this time of the year. The trees are blocking it. Over here toward the east, this is a real tree coming up. Folks. We're not too far away from the winter sky. And there's your ticket for the winter sky, Orion the Hunter, just now coming into play. So many incredible bright stars in this area here. It is the best part of the sky, without question. Now, one step further, at the edge of the circle is the horizon, the center of the circle is the zenith. Anything near that center of the circle is going to be almost at the top of the sky. So Cepheus and the W, Cassiopeia, the W, and the Great Square, they're all pretty high up in the sky. So you're out there watching meteors. Meteors sometimes will make a streak that long, sometimes longer, a lot of times shorter. Now, these are all, if they're Leonids, they're supposed to be coming out of Leo. Now, you don't see Leo in this chart because it's too early. You don't see Leo at 8 o'clock in the evening in November. Leo, you have to wait either until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning now or catch it in January, February at 8 o'clock. So Leo is below the edge here, and that's a problem. I'll explain that just a little later. But we know that that meteor must be a Leonid because it's coming right out of Leo. Same with that one. Same with that one again. Same with that one. That's not, that is not a Leonid. It's headed toward Leo. It's got to be going away. This, by the way, I saw one of these a few nights ago. I was out looking, just checking the sky out for meteors. And there's another minor shower called the Taurids. They come out of Taurus. And here's where Taurus is. There was one that came straight down like that, right out of the, right out of the sky. Fairly bright. It might have been a fireball. Okay, we have special meteors. We've already talked about the fireballs. They're the big guys with large meteoroids, and they really light it up. But then you have something called Earth grazers. Most meteors that hit the Earth's atmosphere are pretty much coming straight in, head on. And they don't last very long, and they don't have a real long path. We have these Earth grazers. Earth grazers are meteors that don't come straight into the Earth. They kind of skim us. They kind of hit our atmosphere on, on a slant. So the fireballs, Lori Stokes, seen that there's that fireball again. That's a good fireball. Now, there's an earth grazer. You see how that meteor, instead of coming straight in like this, that meteor is going right along the edge. And sometimes it actually bends around and sort of comes back the other way. That'll be seen over hundreds of miles. There's one right there, photograph of, a, of an earth grazing meteor. Now that, often they're brighter too. And they'll be seen by more than just one neighborhood. That one where the girl's car got hit, that was seen over five or six 
different states. Clearly, that was an earth raiser, no question about it. Here's one, they've had several of these. They're very, very unusual. I think it's only three or four times it's happened in the last 100, 150 years. We have been a, a meteor will come in, the grazer will come in like that. And then go back on that. The grazer will come in, and instead of just dying right away or dying after a few, it, it actually follows the whole atmosphere and comes right around and comes out the other side. That's incredible. That, that, it's only three or four times that's happened, but that's very special when that happens. And there it is. You can see some of it, what happened right there. Well, if you're really serious, don't want to just pack it in at nine or 10 o'clock. Now you go out at two o'clock in the, the morning tonight. Well, I'm, I'm checking here. I think our, our weather might be a little, a little shaky. I think we're getting some clouds. It may not be good. I, to show you the contrast, what I've done here, I've taken the star chart and I've taken, taken one half of each one, the eastern half. Now this is eight o'clock tonight. This is what that same sky looks like at two o'clock at night. You notice, you see here's Orion, right over here is Orion coming up in the east. By the time you get to, by the time you get to two o'clock in the morning, here's Orion over here. Six hours, that's a quarter of a day. So in a quarter of a day, Orion's moved from the edge here right over to the middle. And this is what I mean, folks, in terms of the sky in the wintertime, these stars are fantastic. There's so many bright stars in here. And what's happened, of course, in doing it, see, in the other, the other pictures I showed, Leo was over here, it wasn't in the sky. And you see over here, it's in the sky now. And what that does, you see more meteors, and I'll tell you why. There's Leo. Um, this is this is the eight o'clock version. There's the two o'clock version. See, the problem is in the eight o'clock, the only meteors you see are the ones coming this way. You don't see any of the ones going that way. But if you go out at two o'clock, you see the ones coming this way, and you see the ones going that way because now Leo's above the ground. You see more more meteors because Leo is fully exposed like that. All right, <laughs> it's it's not the best night. And by the way, I should warn you. When it says 40 or 20, you might think, oh, good, I'm going to get 40 meteors in an hour, at least one every two minutes, one every three minutes. Oh, I can't wait. And you go out, you find one at 10 after, and 20 after comes, nothing. 25 after comes, nothing. Maybe half past comes after 20 minutes, you find a meteor. So it can be like that sometimes. Sometimes you just sound lucky, or maybe you've just hit the wrong pocket. Because it's not a perfectly steady shower. You'll have time during the night where you'll have more, other times less. So what I'm showing here is two meteors, one at 8.34, one at 8.49. That means there's 15 minutes that you're just looking up at the sky with nothing to do. Well, you have something to do because if you look up at that sky, besides looking for some of the constellations, and by the way, we can just, it's a little fuzzy, but that is Orion right there. And there's Taurus the bull over here. And some of these other constellations, it's tough to see these are these are stars right in here, but back to that. What you can look for, satellites. You may have seen satellites. I, don't, I would assume most, most of you have had a chance to see a satellite or two of going across. You'll be out some night looking up at the sky and you'll see what looks like an airplane. But it's moving slower than an airplane. Airplanes don't take six or seven minutes to go across the sky. Satellites do. The other thing about a satellite, airplanes, you don't want to see an airplane all of a sudden disappear two thirds of the way across the sky. You don't want to see that at all. You see that with satellites because what will happen all of a sudden, it gets, it's out of the sun. Of course, the best one is the space station. In the space, space station or any satellite, when you see them, what they're doing, you're over here in the dark. You're standing right there. The satellite is up here in the sunlight. So if sunlight hits that, you're able to see that lighted satellite. And then when it comes down, when it comes back down, you'll finally come down into the shadow and that's when it disappears. So as this satellite's doing this, you'll see it, see it, see it, see it. And finally all of a sudden, it still should be up in the sky, but it goes into that shadow and it's gone. That's why they disappear like that. See the same thing here. It's going right across the sky and all of a sudden it just disappears. 
all of a sudden just see it cut off. You'll even, before it even cuts off, you'll see it getting fainter, 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 and finally just stops. Now, if you want to know when the satellites are going to be there, there's a way of telling. This, by the way, is the International Space Station. This is actually over London. This is taken from another book. But you can see 556, 602. That's about a six minute trip across the sky. If you want to know when satellites are going to be visible, go to heavens above. Heavens above. And what they will do, they will give you a chart, they'll give you the list of satellites, including the ISS. And they'll show you. In the course of a certain time period, they'll show you every satellite that's going across the sky. They'll give you the direction of this. They'll tell you when it's going to be. They'll tell you how high, how high it's going to be, how bright it's going to be. So, for instance, when you see magnitudes, you like to see a magnitude in the threes. Or, and, and that's a really good one right there. The lower the number, the better, the, the brighter the star or the brighter the satellite. The other thing you want to be looking at, especially now, especially if you go out for the ones in December, then you're going to see Orion and you'll see there's Leo and you'll see the dog and you'll see the twins. You'll see all the good satellites. There's a big dipper right there. Now this is a chart. You're not, we sent this to you. You didn't get the dark one. You got, you got the evening sky map sent to you online. Evening sky map, every month they publish that, every month for free. Just go to that website, download it, print it, and you've got yourself a star chart. Again, the same principle here. You notice the circle, that's your horizon. The center is the zenith. And of course, these are all the constellations. The blue here would be the Milky Way. Now, if you're out there, if you're out there, of course, you, if you don't take a binoculars with you, you're gonna have trouble seeing some of these things, obviously, the, 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 the fine objects, but you'll see the constellations without any trouble. Another thing, nice thing about it, on the other side of that sheet, they give you some background here, glossary, but really good thing. You'll notice easily seen with the naked eye, easily seen with binoculars. And if you have a telescope, these are things to look at with a telescope. So it breaks down your targets. Depending on what you have, it tells you what to go for. So there's a list of things with binoculars. If you have your binocs with you and you have a little idea of what the, where the constellations are, you can take a look at them, some of those things on that list. But I implore you, the best thing on this list right here is M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. I'll show you how to get that in just a second. The other thing you're going to notice when you go out, three, you go out and you'll see three planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars. Mars is really easy to see. It's fairly high up in the sky. Jupiter and Saturn are starting to get away from us. You go out at 10 o'clock, you're not going to see them because they'll be below the horizon. But you go out at 8 o'clock or so, You'll see those two over there by the southwest, and you'll see Mars more or less in the south, or maybe a little bit toward the southeast. Those two are easy to see, and they're two relatively bright, bright, bright planets, and this is a bright one also. That's what it looked like in the sky for you. Only they'll be down more down here. They'll be they'll be lower. Now this is a little star chart for this time of the of the month starting November 18th in a couple of days. There's Jupiter and Saturn. That's what the moon is going to look like. So the moon's going to be getting bigger. It's still, it's a very small moon now. It's very thin. That's why it's a good night for meteors if the clouds don't mess us up. But each night, the, the moon's moving further over and getting bigger and bigger. And what's happening, Jupiter is catching up with Saturn. They're, they don't stay put. They move around the sun. And as they move around the sun, they change where they are in the sky. There it is right there. Jupiter, what Jupiter is doing, Jupiter is catching up with, with Saturn. See, Jupiter is, takes only 12 years or so to go around the sun. Saturn takes 25 years to go around. So basically, Jupiter is catching up. Now, they're going to be in December, December 21st, right around the first day of winter. Jupiter and Saturn will be closest to each other since 1623. They'll be so close to all the, well, I'll show you how close they are. They're about, they'll be that close. They'll be one fifth the size of the, of the moon away from each other. Now, back to Andromeda. Andromeda is easy to find. If you know where, if you know where, start with the, 
the square, Pegasus, the great square, and there it is. And coming off of the corner of Pegasus, there are two lines of stars here. That's the Andromeda constellation. The second pair of stars, first pair, this is probably better to use it. It's the second pair, it's the third pair. The middle pair go right up that same distance. There's the Andromeda galaxy. Looks that's a fantastic thing to look for. That's our, that's our neighbor, that's our twin. That's what it looks like in, in a telescope. Actually, in, in binoculars, not even a telescope. Telescope sees it even better than that. It's two and a half million light years away from us. That means the light you're getting from that galaxy left there back in the year roughly two and a half million years BC. It's just now reaching your eyes. It just gives you the feeling of the grandeur of the sky. Interesting thing is, Day's going to come when it won't be two and a half million light years away from us. Day's going to come and it's going to be with us. Because in several billion years, what's going to happen? Andromeda and Milky Way are going to merge. They're going to become one. And that'll, that will be quite an event when that happens. No two stars will hit. But it's going to make a real mess in the sky. Because Andromeda is approaching us at a steady rate. That's what it looks like in a big telescope. Interesting enough, Andromeda as galaxies going around it. This galaxy here goes around it. This galaxy there goes around it. All right, it takes us to the Geminids. This comes up in the 14th of December. 120 at the peak. It's gonna be cold. I always tell people, layer, layer, layer. Dress as warmly as you possibly can. And of course, the Geminids will all come out of Gemini. All radiated away from Gemini, just like that. Neat thing about it, like I say, you'll be out there with the winter constellations, and those constellations are just so fantastic. They're, they're worth every minute. And again, the range is from 7 to 17. The peak is the 14th. 120, that's one of the best shower groups in the whole list. Not only that, it's interesting enough, a few weeks later, you get the quadradids. Another 120. January is even colder, though. That's the trouble. But those two are the best the best two showers, numerically speaking. So if you're really into it, pick those up. So just going back one more time, you get one of these charts, get yourselves familiar with it, if, you're not, if you don't know how to use a chart. And remember the horizon is on the edge, anything at the top is in the center. Well, a friend of mine, who took a lot of my courses. He must have taken adult school and elder hostel. He must have been in my class 15 times. His advice is very, very good. Keep looking up because that's where the good stuff is. But thank you for being such a nice audience. Even though I couldn't see you, I wish I could have shown you the sky outside, but maybe next, next summer when we do the Perseus, we can catch up on that. Thank you for taking part in this. Thanks so much, Scott. And um, for those of you who have questions, um, it is just past eight, so understandable if you need to, to log off. But if you're able to stay with us a little bit longer and have a question for Scott, um, you can type it in the chat box. Or if you don't know where that is, um, you can unmute yourself and just, just ask it verbally. That's fine. So I'll just wait a few minutes for folks who might be typing. And uh, Scott, in case you can't see the chat box, um, Bob said to everyone, NASA has a website that announces where and when the ISS is visible in your area. Thanks for that tip, Bob. Here's a question uh, from Sarah. Is there any place near Wells, Maine, where you can go and see the sky using a telescope? Great presentation, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, you, you just want to be in an area where you don't have a lot of trees infringing on your horizon. If, if you, you want to, so many times you'll have an object you want to see and you'll get the scope out and you'll start to point it, especially if it's one of the go, is it a go-to telescope, it will automatically track to the, to the object. 
or do you have to do it yourself? Either way, you want to you want to have as wide open a sky as you can. So probably it depends on if if you have your own front yard. Of course, we, fortunately, we don't have a lot of light pollution here. It's one advantage we do have that we're not too far, not too close to any any large city. But it's even so, you don't want to be even if you're looking too much toward oh maybe uh, maybe Portsmouth, you might mess up your sky a little bit. But I. It's really, the, the beach is an open area, but you don't want to be down there at night probably setting up a telescope. I guess, in, well, they reserve, when we do our star parties, you can, you can, do, you can be there till nine o'clock, but of course that's only a couple times a year. Yeah, we, we typically do this program in person. So, so look out for it next year, especially the Perseids in August. Let's see. Lots of lots of thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Thank you so much. This was so awesome. Awesome presentation. <laughs> well, thank you, folks. It was my pleasure. I love talking about the stars. It's just they're fascinating. And if you, especially when you get to the winter sky and those constellations, and really, as you get further and further, it's unfortunately colder and colder. The summer, they don't have that many bright stars. You get toward November, December, and January, the stars are just fantastic. So get out there and find, find those constellations. Scott, here's a question from someone who might be related to you. Eric Negley asks, what's the most meteors you've seen in one night? Well, that one picture, it's hard to beat that one picture because uh, that one picture had, uh, had my wife, Louise, and had... Uh, his his grandmother and had a good neighbor who went to school with me and I took the picture and that's when we saw a thousand Leonids in three hours. We were counting them. And it's funny trying to count meteors up to a thousand. It's not easy. That was easily the best. No, no question about it. Normally a, a good shower though, I'd say I've had nights where I've seen 30, 30 meteors in a meteor shower, but that was something special. Any other questions from folks? Oh, Peter says, thanks, Scott. Excellent presentation with lots of fascinating information. Lynn says, I always enjoy these talks. Thanks so much. I always enjoy bringing them. Thank you. All right. Well, um, if you think of a question, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get it to Scott. Um, you'll find my web, my email on the Wells Reserves webpage, Suzanne Kahn. But otherwise, thanks so much everybody for joining us. Many, many thanks to Scott for, for doing the Zoom thing with us. And uh, we'll hopefully see all of you at the Wells Reserve soon or on another Zoom soon.